Hello everyone, my name is Anton Akhmerov and I'll just be here to introduce the talk and keep an eye on questions, etc. Um, Costas is going to present our work. Uh, uh, welcome everyone. So a quick uh, invitation, please, uh, since there are not a lot of people, do not hesitate to ask questions uh, at any point in time, just interrupt right away. Uh, or if you want, raise hand and, uh, and I'll, uh, or, or write in chat, I'll keep an eye on everything. Hope everything, everyone is doing well and uh, let's uh, hear what Costas has to say. All right, thank you Anton for the introduction. So good afternoon, good morning or good evening for everybody depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Costas Tilkalis and today I'll be presenting one of our uh, recent preprints and archive that has been uh, done by me, um, Lin Wang and Anton Akmarov. Um, so as you can probably see by the title, that is uh, Block Lawrence Oscillations and Delafossites. Um, this title, uh, you know, at first sight, it might seem that it's a bit uh, either complicated or you might not understand it completely, but that's completely fine. That is the, uh, the aim of this talk is that by the end of it, you understand how all of these concepts tie into each other. And of special notice is the, uh, the Block Lawrence part which is going to be kind of the, uh, the heart of our talk. Um, before we get into our little electron volts, we must first establish the stage. And our stage is delafossites. So just a quick rundown of delafossites. So delafossites are mineral materials uh, with kind of chemical formula you see here on the left. They're kind of like the ABO oxides. Um, and for like A and B materials, you know, for A, you usually have something like platinum, palladium, transition metal, um, transition metals. And for B, you have something like co cobalt and um, chromium. And, you know, that's fine and good. Uh, but let's, let's take a look at their structure. So you can see um, their structure um, has this, 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 this unit cell, you can see on the right here. And uh, if you look at it, you know, you see the, these, these, these green planes, these green balls, they represent our A atom, which is either palladium or, or, or platinum. And this usually um, means that uh, this usually kind of corresponds to the conductive layer of, of, of the adelophosite. In between two conductive layers, we have a insulating layer of cobalt oxide or chromium oxide or, or whatever. And, and, and as I mentioned, this layer is it's insulating. Now, this structure is, uh, is fine, but it's maybe a bit more, it's, it's more complicated at, uh, than what we require of it. So we can kind of easily deconstruct it into having, into being just uh, alternating layers of metal and insulator. And this is what we're going to use kind of later in the talk, but that's basically what it is. It's, it's just, you could view it as a heterostructure of alternating metal and insulator layer. Now you might be asking, you know, you know, this delafossites, yeah, they seem cool, but uh, you know, what do we do with them? What's, what's kind of the research potential here? And to answer that, uh, kind of the one of the answers lies in their room temperature resistivity. And if you look at it, uh, you can see here on kind of the center of the screen that the palladium and platinum have a really, really high conductivity at room temperature, almost as high as these elemental materials like silver and copper, which is quite amazing. And you know, part of the reason why these materials are so conductive is because they have a very high Fermi velocity, which is close to the free electron value but also because their mean free path is quite high at, at, at uh, room temperature, 600 angstroms. You know, that's quite cool, but that's not the kicker yet. What is really amazing is that if you decrease the temperature even more, you see that at around 10 Kelvin or less, the mean free path just becomes 20 microns, which kind of in mesoscopic physics is just forever. You know, these electrons can just flow in the Laplace without of, you know, practically ever encountering a scattering event. Um, it, it, now, Kostas, do you or anyone else understand why this is the case? Why the mean free path is so long? Oh, yes, I, I was going to get into it. And, and, you know, thanks for asking the question. And one of the reasons why, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's because of their kind of like, the lafossites have a very, very um, uh, clean, pure nature. So if you were to look at the defects in the lafossites, they have something like one, defect to the 10 to the 10 sites. 
Um, and you know, it's, it's from my understanding, it's uh, from fabrication, which is not a lot. Um, you know, it's very hard to actually. Uh, it's it's very easy to produce these these delafosside samples being ultra pure. They just kind of are are like that, just by, by base value. Um, now it's 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 entirely like a different uh, kind of field of research and understanding why they grow so pure. And for that, I guess I, I, I point you to this uh, review paper by uh, Professor Andrew McKenzie. Um, yeah, so, okay, so, so that's pretty cool. That's the in-plane properties. Um, but, you know, what about the outer plane properties? Uh, what, what about, you know, what do we know about them? Well, um, you know, the same question was posed, uh, maybe, uh, was posed by, uh, uh, the lab of, of Professor Philip Moll uh, at EPFL. And what he did was basically, okay, so they take this, this delafosside crystal. So here the, the yellow balls represent kind of this uh, conductive layer of platinum or palladium. And in between you have these, uh, uh, the insulin layer, right? And these uh, uh, lines at the top represent the unit cell, okay? So what he did is they first applied a magnetic field in plane. So in the plane of the conductive layer, um, and then they basically did a conductance measurement. So they passed the current going out of plane. So basically the current was going through the sample and they measured the voltage, okay? And on the right, you can see kind of the, uh, the image of the sample and just a kind of some length scales. So, you know, this, this, this width of the sample is maybe about something like five microns, okay? So below the mean free path uh, of, for, for the electrons in the lophocytes. And this, this was, these were done at various temperatures. Um, and what was seen was these, uh, you know, magnetic resistance curves, which at first sight, this might seem unimpressive. But if you take a closer look, you see that there's something very, very weird happening. And, you know, we can maybe get a closer look if we take the second order derivative of these curves, and we see that we have these oscillations. You know, now oscillations themselves are quite interesting. And, you know, we, we, we would kind of want to understand what is their origin. But, you know, before kind of trying to understand the mystery of, the, of these uh, oscillations, um, let's kind of like deepen the mystery with a few more kind of uh, measurements. And one of those measurements was their temperature dependence. And you can see that these oscillations are incredibly resistant to temperature. Um, you can go maybe something like to 60 Kelvin and these oscillations still persist, which is you know, quite amazing if this was some kind of interference effect, which means that just the coherence in this de la Fossa is just amazing, okay? Um, okay, so, you know, it's, it's quite a huge mystery and, and we'd like to know what is happening here. You know, is this an interference effect? You know, what is happening in the samples? Why, the, in these, why these oscillations appear? And, you know, to first understand this or to first kind of uh, undig this mystery, we must take a look at their behavior. And you know what they found in that paper is that the behavior basically corresponds to this uh, formula here. So these oscillations behave this, this sinusoidal behavior. Um, and just to kind of give you some um, uh, analogies, just you know, you, so you could ba basically understand what units mean. Wh uh, what I present the sample on the left. Um, okay, so, so just to deconstruct uh, what all of these terms mean. So we see we have this uh, kind of geometric term here. Uh, indicated by this blue box here, um, which actually corresponds, if you look to the left, which corresponds to this grade area. So it's basically the area between two conductive layers, okay? Well, that's pretty cool. But what the really interesting part is the left part. Um, you can see that it's uh, E over H bar, which you know is, is a quantum mechanical fundamental constant. So this already gives us an idea of where to look. So we can see that this is probably some quantum origin, okay? So, with that in mind, let's take a look at some, you know, pure quantum explanations. Um, and first on our list uh, is the aronoff bohm effect. Now, if you don't know the aronoff bohm effect, what it is is basically if you imagine if you have a like a loop, um, and you can have, you know, the electron traveling either clockwise or anticlockwise. You know, both directions are identical. But if you apply a magnetic field or magnetic flux through the loop. Now, these uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise uh, motions have a different phase. And you know, if they, in, they basically interfere in various ways. And you can control their interference by you know, modulating the, uh, the flux going through the loop. 
and you get these beating pattern, okay? So if I take a look at the sample, we can basically kind of, uh, you know, draw this loop that we see based on like kind of the, uh, the area of the oscillations. Um, and we see that we have these, 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 these loops here and, you know, everything agrees. So the units agree, the, 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 the equations agree, but there is a slight problem. Um, we did say that the middle layer was insulating, so it wouldn't really make sense because that would imply that the edges were metallic, which is not the case. The edges are not metallic, so, you know, this explanation is just not realistic. Okay, so this completely falls through. Now, a second explanation is the Shubnikov the Haas effect. And again, if you don't know, the uh, Shubnikov the Haas effect. Can Sorry? I ask a question about the. Uh, clearly, there's tunneling between the layers, right? Uh, yes. Because there is a resistance in the Z direction. So, yeah. So there is a bend in the Z direction as well. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, thank you. Yeah, uh, I understand. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, it's an excellent question, but that would also imply that, uh, you know, the edges were for some reason more favorable for this tunneling this, because this tunneling can happen anywhere, right? So, yeah, but, but, it, but even when it, even if it happens anywhere, you would still see oscillations damped a little bit, but, but you will still see a periodicity of, uh, I mean, this is like what happens in a long Josephson junction. A, a uh, but, 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 but these oscillations would then kind of be, um, so, 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 so the oscillation frequency, uh, I guess it would be broadened by very much so. And also, you know, this, this single loop is not special. You could have many more loops going through and you have many more kind of modes of, modes of these, uh, modes of these loops. And you would have many, many frequencies, but the experiments don't really see, uh, these frequencies. You only see basically as just a single frequency, which, which is given by the equation there. So yeah, but if, if the... Uh, okay, but I shouldn't uh, interfere too much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Um, yes, so the second possible explanation is the Shubnik of the Haas effect. Um, and once again, if you don't know, Shubnik of the Haas happens, you know, if you have a very strong uh, magnetic field, uh, your sample starts forming Landau levels, and, you know, these Landau levels basically uh, go through a Fermi level. Uh, Fermi level. And you, know, you see an increase in conductance and then they pass through the Fermi level and then again, the conductance is up to zero and you get these oscillations again. Um, but the problem is that these oscillations would be inverse to the magnetic field. And if you remember our previous formula, um, the oscillations were kind of a proportional to the magnetic field. So once again, you know, this explanation is not good. Okay, so I mean, uh, you know, our kind of simple pure quantum explanations are falling through. And, you know, so what, what is going on here? Like, uh, how can we explain this? Obviously, quantum mechanics can be wrong. That's a bit too conceited to think about it. But in order to kind of confirm that, we would need to run like a full quantum simulation of this, of this system. And, you know, you know so, so as I mentioned, you need to like set up a huge tight binding model, put a magnetic field, and then, you know, run numerics. And, you know, with numerics, you, 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 you can't really hope to achieve analytics in this system because you need to also model the boundaries because W the, the width of the sample comes into play here. Um, so you have to run numerics and, you know, numerics are great, but in the end, you'll just get a lot of pretty looking plots with maybe not as much physical insight as you would get from analytics. So, you know, that's not a great start. Unless we use semi-classics. Now, you know, in the first place, there really wasn't a, a, a huge reason for us to even consider an interference effect because delafossites are, you know, first and foremost, uh, they're metals, they're conductive metals. They have, you know, quite uh, large electron densities. So you wouldn't really expect the interference to be playing a part here. So, you know, let's, let's, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens if we sum the classics, okay? Um, you know, just to give a brief uh, rundown of semi-classics. So, you know, in classical physics, you have, you know, velocity, which is trivially related to momentum. And then this uh, momentum evolution is dictated by forces. Now, semi-classics basically extend this motion. And, you know, we, we still have velocity and we still have momentum, but now it's replaced by crystal momentum. And our velocity is defined through the dispersion relation. And our crystal momentum is basically defined, uh, the evolution of it is basically defined the same way through the forces. Um, so we already see from these formulas that we need uh, one ingredient, at least, uh, and that is the dispersion relation. So let's set up a very, very minimal tight-biting model just to get that. 
So to achieve this, um, since we have in the conductive plane, uh, our, 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 the conducting plane is basically hexagonal, you know, we get this hexagonal unit cell. We say, okay, we have nearest neighbor hoppings. You know, that's the first part. But, you know, just to keep in mind, um, this, 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 this in-plane geometry is not really what's important here. You, know, you could have a cubic or, or not cubic, but like a square or, or anything. What is important though, is to consider the uh, kind of tunneling through the, through the planes, uh, through the, you know, neighboring metal uh, planes. And we call this TZ. And, you know, as I mentioned, the, 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 the vital point here is this approximation here is that we say that these, this hopping between two planes is, 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 is small compared to the uh, in-plane nearest neighbor hopping. And we call this the quasi two uh, dispersion approximation, okay? And in essence, what this gives us in this case is this cylindrical Fermi surface. So you see kind of in-plane, you have this hexagonal shape, which is nice, but like out of plane, the, uh, uh, the Fermi surface is basically flat. And if you apply our previous kind of formulas for velocity, you know, since this is basically fat, you, uh, flat, uh, you, would, you would see that the velocity is, 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 is very negligible, okay? All right, so uh, that's the first ingredient. Um, the second thing we need is, uh, as I mentioned, um, since in our formula that we saw for the frequency, width plays a part here. So we must be able to model the boundaries in our sample. And that is exactly what we do. We uh, kind of set up two, um, two infinite boundaries uh, along the y direction. Um, and, you know, we use, in, in this kind of animation here, I show kind of specular boundary conditions, but uh, what we actually use in the paper is, is diffuse boundary condition. It's just easier to plot. However, um, the exact choice of boundary conditions doesn't really affect our results. And we see oscillations in either case, and it doesn't seem to affect um, kind of the frequency of the oscillations, but it, I mean, it, it probably does affect kind of the overall shape of the conductance profile. So that's, uh, uh, so that's kind of all of our ingredients. So let's try to kind of like um, explain within our kind of like limited assumptions, how does the motion of a particle under our assumptions look like? Okay, so we have two boundaries. Um, you know, the here, the, the, uh, the vertical bar is basically the z direction, the horizontal direction is, is, the, is the x, the width of the sample. And let's say we have a electron that is initially traveling with Fermi velocity from left to right. And then we apply a magnetic field. Now, from kind of a naive standpoint, if you were to apply the, the right hand rule or, or whatever you use to kind of calculate the Lorentz force and so on, um, you would expect the particle to travel in these kind of orbits hugging, hugging the uh, boundary. But that is not, it, but that's not what's happening. What is actually happening is that because our, because, because of our quasi two dispersion approximation, um, our out of plane velocity is, is, is negligible compared to the in plane velocity. And therefore, um, the, 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 if, if we, we kind of like, if, if we take a look at, uh, you know, it, it, because of the, um, because the velocity out of plane is negligible, the Lorentz force created kind of a lot along, uh, along the, uh, the x direction is also negligible. So our x velocity does not change much. So it's almost basically staying constant. So if we kind of assume that it stays constant under our quasi, quasi two dispersion approximation, we can, you know, plug into our semi classical equations and we see that kz has this kind of unique relationship with position X. And, you know, just to kind of stress this, this relationship is, is, is a bit more general that I present here. Um, you know, you could have a field, magnetic field also have a component along the Z direction. And this, this equation would not change. It's not influenced by that. It only matters that uh, it only takes in your uh, BY. So, you know, if, if we uh, then use this, uh, thing that we have on the left, we can actually derive our um, uh, the the actual trajectory of our particle, and it's you see the, the particle kind of uh, follows this 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 oscillating pattern, which is exactly exactly what we need. And if we just plot it out, it looks like this. So if it travels through the sample, you know the the z direction has oscillations, but the on the, uh, along the south the x direction, you know it it moves with the fairly like. Uh, constant uh, velocity, okay? 
Now, just to kind of maybe explain a bit more why these oscillations happen is that if we take a look at the KZ balloon zone, and here I kind of point out the negative and positive uh, balloon zones of KZ, um, let's say we start a particle that is in the negative uh, branch of the balloon, uh, balloon zone. Um, because of the Lorentz force that is uh, exerted on the particle, the particle starts like drifting upwards uh, in the KZ balloon zone. And when it hits the, uh, the positive boundary, it goes backwards because of the periodicity of the balloon zone. And that is exactly why we have these oscillations. Now, um, there is another mechanism which works very similarly to what we have here, and it's called block oscillations. And with block oscillations, what you have is that if you imagine that you have a sample, you apply an electric field, and alongside the direction you apply the electric field through, you have momentum drift going along that direction. And you have this exactly same thing. The momentum kind of goes from one end to the other of the balloon zone and loops back and you have these oscillations. Of course, that is assuming that your, your scattering is, is non-existent in the sample, uh, but that's details. Um, now, okay, so this looks fairly similar to block oscillations, but there is a very, very huge distinction. And that is the fact that this whole momentum drift is enabled by the Lorentz force. So you can probably already tie into our, uh, our, our, our title uh, page, our, our, uh, yeah, our title. Um, okay, but let's see what, you know, how, how, the, how do these trajectories change with changing magnetic fields? So for example, if you decrease the value of magnetic field, you see the trajectory basically um, uh, changes their, its frequency, right? It, it, you, you can, if you control the magnetic field strength, you can basically decide how many wavelengths fit inside uh, between the two boundaries. Okay. All right, so that was our simple kind of picture, but let's see if that actually works. So let's plug in all, all of our ingredients, our semi-classics, our quasi-dispersion and our boundaries, and let's see what happens, okay? So this is what we get. So this is what I plot here is current, uh, but we see that, you know, first and foremost, uh, I, I plot the X axis kind of already in the units of our, of our oscillations. So we see that we indeed do get the oscillations at the correct frequency. However, there seems to be a bit of a problem. And I'm not, I'm comparing different things here. I'm comparing current to resistivity. But uh, if you look at these points here, you see that the current goes to zero, which basically implies that the resistivity should be infinite, which is obviously not what we see on the right. You know, the resistivity doesn't go into infinity. So yeah, so we have probably made some mistake along the way and we must re-examine our assumptions, you know? Um, but just to kind of give you an idea why these kind of divergence, uh, divergencies happen, um, you know, if you go back to our simple model and we have our velocity, uh, our particle traveling from velocity from left to right, and then we tune the magnetic field to actually give us kind of a trajectory that fits like exactly into the sample. So you see, as it travels from left to right, it doesn't really move anywhere along the Z direction, right? So where it started on the Z axis, it basically ended there. So it didn't really move upwards or downwards. So, so, so that's why there is no current um, at, these, at these kind of resonance points. Um, just to kind of emphasize, I made a few uh, animations. Um, so we can consider kind of different trajectories to start with different phases. And let's, uh, let's first see the case uh, when the frequency is once again commensurate, which, which is I, I just described. So, you know, we have a bunch of these particles um, traveling, but at the end, they all kind of, uh, they all basically bunch up back to zero, right? So we don't have any current because all trajectories, they, they, they don't really move anywhere in the Z direction. So zero current, right? Now in the incommensurate case, if we tune our magnetic field to you know, not fit exactly into the sample. What we see in this case is once again, these, you know, you see all these trajectories, but this time the, at the very end, you know, you have, you have different, different trajectories which actually move quite a lot, um, positive or negative direction. So uh, that's exactly why we have a current response in these cases. Now, you know, like, uh, so we'd like to kind of emulate this but in the commensurate case. So we want to, you know, we want to avoid divergencies and we want to make it so that even in the commensurate case, 
that the, these particles still move some distance along the z direction. And there exists one possible generalization of our theory, and that is scattering. So let's see what happens when we add some scattering into the system. So you see now like the, the, these trajectories are not perfectly like um, oscillating. Um, and what the really important part is, is that by the end of it, you see they don't really converge back to z, uh, z equals zero. So they kind of move in, in various directions. And that's exactly what you want, because in this case, our current would not be zero um, as, as we see in our, our very previous simple model, okay? Sorry, okay. I have a question. Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. In the end, they land, uh, in the end, they land randomly above or below the starting point. So mm -hmm. should the average current be zero then when you average over all the starting velocities? Yes, if there was no electric field. So okay. in this case, uh, the way in our model, what you kind of in, in, in this linearized Boltzmann equations, what the electric field basically plays a role of basically it, it, it favors one trajectory over the other. So it basically favors trajectories which have, you could say that point along the, you know, if, if we apply electric field over like the positive case of direction, we could say that the trajectories which basically spend more time traveling uh, along the positive direction, they're favored. So they're gonna be populated more in this, in this uh, kind of Boltzmann description. And, okay, and that, so, the, so the current that you were plotting earlier, this was already in uh, electric field. Yes, so, so the electric field, uh, so in these plots, it's just, you know, uh, particles in the magnetic field, there's no uh, electric field here, but uh, the previous model did assume that there's an electric field going out of plane. It basically just changes how the, we, we populate these, these trajectories. Okay, thank you. All right, okay, so we need scattering, but there is a huge problem. And the fact that, uh, as I said at the beginning of this talk, we don't really have much scattering in the Laplace size, okay? So our sample is something like five microns in width, but you know the mean free path of the Laplace size is something like twenty microns. So you know we shouldn't expect much scattering here. Um, so I guess that's it. You know that's as far as our theory goes. You know we can't do much about that. We can't just disagree with experimental evidence, unless we consider plane scattering. And now bear with me. Um, now, all of these measurements that are done on the Lafossites, you know, they look at their, you know, impressive conductive properties in plane. And, you know, this, 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 this mean free path in plane is really amazing, but there's not much um, kind of uh, research going on on these out of plane scattering, um, uh, just these models for out of plane scattering. And now, even if you introduce some out of plane scattering, it doesn't really affect uh, your, your, your kind of motion in plane. So we're not really disagreeing with any already established data. So that's great. So you know, let's see what happens if, if we do incl include some out of plane scattering. Okay. Okay. So now you know we we add an additional ingredient that is scattering. Uh, and voila, we see that uh, with uh, you know uh, I think I use something like the the mean free path kind of uh, in this case implies the the, the path. Uh, electron takes without encountering any scattering event. So not just in plane. And I use something maybe like 4.4 microns. So it's a kind of a bit of a deviation from 20 microns. So it already kind of tells you that there is a, there might be some huge anisotropy between in plane and out of plane scattering of the Lafossites. But aside that, we see that we do get a very nice agreement with the experiment. You know, we reproduce the oscillations. We see that our oscillations are not going to infinities. Um, they're damped, so scattering damps the oscillations. And you know, there are some deviations, uh, which I'll get into in, in a bit. Um, but I also have to transparent with you and show you the, uh, the overall kind of uh, resistivity plot. And we see that you know, at the start, at low fields, you know, it's fine. It kind of agrees uh, nicely with uh, kind of other samples. But then it starts to deviate. You know? so, so you see that these experimental sample, um, you know, it starts to kind of like curve up, whereas we kind of just stay on a line. And, to give kind of a several explanations for that, you know, the first maybe not so important explanation is that uh, you know we use a very simple scattering model here, so we don't actually know what the scattering, what the outer plane scattering looks like in these delafossites. So we use a use a kind of a very simple toy model. Okay, now a second, a more important explanation, actually has to do with the boundary conditions. Okay, so 
as I mentioned previously, what we do in our kind of analysis, what we have is two parallel boundaries. Um, and you see kind of, again, this animation play out here. But in, in the real sample, what you have is more of a, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's the real life, we have a box, right? Um, and within this box, the length of the box is actually smaller than the width in the experimental kind of uh, uh, setup. And you can see like the animation here, you know, the, the directories are not so simple, which is exactly why we couldn't analytically treat it. It's it just the addition, having two boundaries is fine, but having four boundaries is a bit too much. But besides that, um, having more boundaries means there's more scattering, which means resistivity should go up, which would explain kind of our, our deviation that we see between our theoretical and experimental predictions. Now, you know, with this comes a prediction that if we actually increase the length uh, of the experimental sample and we repeat the measurement, then hopefully uh, the experimental um, data should agree with our theory here. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, I'll actually conclude my talk. So, you know, uh, we have successfully, I hope, explained that the uh, uh, semi-classical theory is able to explain the, uh, the oscillations in delafossites. Uh, these oscillations resemble block oscillations, uh, but they have a Lorentz driving force. Um, just to kind of a, a few ingredients that you need to get these block patterns of uh, uh, oscillations is you need a, a quasi 2D dispersion. So you need like a quasi 2D sample. You need the out of electric field, once again, because of the kind of the population of the different trajectories. You need an in-play magnetic field. And preferably you need a large mean free path because if your sample scatters a lot, then your, you know, your, your oscillations are going to get uh, damped and you're not going to see anything. Additionally, we might have seen that the momentum relaxation in the Lafosse sites could be highly anisotropic. Um, so that's kind of like a maybe something maybe further research needs to look into and develop a more detailed model of this aeroplane scattering. Um, but with that, I conclude my talk and I open up the floor for questions. Uh, so, so can I uh, uh, ask a question or a comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, it's it's uh, what I uh, was hinting to when I wrote you, Costa. Uh, uh, I think when we talk about semi-classical or quantum or classical, which you you made the distinction earlier on, uh, of course, those are uh, concepts that need to be uh, defined. And, and I think a, a useful way to define it, to define them is anything that has thermodynamic uh, magnetization or thermodynamic response to a magnetic field uh, is quantum mechanical by, by the uh, Bohr von Lo uh, what, what's the name? This two, uh, uh, Bohr and, and someone, uh, TUN. Um, so, 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 I think it's it's really interesting to uh, ask whether in this model that you are talking about there would be a um, thermodynamical response to a, a to a magnetic field um, and and my my feeling is uh, the physics is what you know I would call a one of them uh, but I don't mind calling it in any of the other names but it's quantum mechanical um and 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 i don't uh, uh, um, think that uh, i mean having the tunneling anywhere along the the layers would exclude this uh, it would change the shape of the oscillations but that shape is not sinusoidal anyway uh so so that's what i want to do oh, yeah uh, yeah uh sure uh thank you for um, I'm sorry, uh, was that, was that a general comment or, or was there a question? Um, uh, it, 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 it was just a, a suggestion that doing a, a thermodynamic calculation of magnetization would be something interesting to do. And by now, what can I say? You are the obvious candidate to do it because you thought about it so much. So, uh, 
I mean, yeah, I just, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. I just want to motivate this preparation. Uh, this, this definitely sounds interesting. Um, I just, I guess I have now some experience with like uh, Boltzmann uh, uh, modeling, but uh, I'm still not sure how to like model these magnetic effects. But it's definitely something that uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at. I, I, I might actually look at this into the future. Um, thank you for your suggestion. Actually, I can, I can give some advice on this if you'd like. Oh, thank you. We can thank talk offline so sometimes. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, thank you for the, for the very nice talk, first of all. Um, so my first question is, um, I didn't understand why your resistivity plot has, your theory has no dependence on W. My theory has no dependence on W? Yeah, that's so that plot. If you, this, so here your dashed plot, why yeah. is there no dependence on, or are you, or? Oh, sorry, yeah, so uh, I think I know what you're trying to ask. Um, yeah, sorry, so, so this maybe was an oversight on, on, on my part making these plots. Um, I only uh, kind of made the plot only for this blue curve here. So I basically, the fit is only applicable to this blue curve. Ah, okay, um, got it, got it. But, but I mean, yes, so the oscillations here are gonna be different, but the, probably the, uh, the, uh, the overall kind of the profile of the conductance is, is gonna be fairly similar, even though they might have different Fermi velocities and so on. Um, but, but as I mentioned in our case, the bigger problem is the boundaries along uh, like the, the length of the sample. I see, I see. And uh, the other yeah. question was, um, so at some point you mentioned this, uh, you had a, like a way of, of validating your theory with this, uh, like this limit where you should see a better agreement. But at some point you also uh, predicted a mean free path out of plane. So I was wondering if a measurement of that could also be used to validate uh, your, your model. Yes, possibly. So that's, I think we were talking about it uh, previously. Um, there was an idea of, 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 of measuring like uh, conductance going through um, like uh, along the Z direction and, and trying to kind of estimate it from there, um, which is, I guess it's possible, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know like the subtleties in, in making these experiments and what kind of like noises or, or, or whatever kind of different uh, subtle effects you should expect. So I, I'm afraid I can't really comment on, on, on this that well, but I think it seems reasonable, yes, that you can probably um, estimate it from kind of from the mean free path as well. Okay, thanks. And maybe make a few quick questions and comments. So thanks for the <clears throat> thanks for the presentation. I mean, we had discussed before. It's 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 still good to see everything in a in a somewhat coherent uh, way. There's a, there's a couple of comments I would uh, I'd make. I think with this box argument, now I understand this a little bit better. There should also be uh, uh, we need to um, we need to think about the hexagonal shape, and so the. The, the, the trajectories that you do have on the facets of these, they're actually rather one dimensional. So they wouldn't be able to go in, in any of the, of the in-plane directions. Now, the other thing is that, of course, when one can take this theory and semi-classically fine tune now an out-of-plane scattering. And that's really what you need, right? You need much significantly enhanced out-of-plane scattering than in-plane scattering for this to, to happen, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, 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 so that really doesn't seem to be, uh, at least within experimental uh, evidence. So one thing that you can do is you can take these bars and you can irradiate them. So we have different types of disorder studies, and we show that the essential behavior is just perfectly mapped back onto itself with the scaling of the in-plane mean free path. So now, of course, one can say, well, what if you have a scattering process that some of the irradiation just doesn't change the out of plane scattering, right? But in some sense, the scattering process becomes very uh, exotic by itself in, in that way. And the other question is, uh, and the other statement, I guess, is that if you apply an out of plane magnetic field and you look into the C axis transport, essentially there you, you wind the states into spirals that can fit into these cylinders. So in high enough magnetic fields, the longitudinal magnetic transport is exactly a measurement of that scattering rate. And it doesn't seem to be that much different. So at least from an experimental point of view, it's there. I, I take all your, your, your comments on the, on the uh, uh, thermodynamic, uh, uh, or on, the, on, the, on the high temperature 
of the quantum path, but it just doesn't seem like there is a big difference in the scattering mechanism, at least in the experiments. The same is true, by the way, for ARPIS measurements, which also don't see a, a very strong deviation in the bounds which are in these directions. So I'm just, I, I, I think there's something missing <laughs> still in this picture. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, thanks for the comments. So yes, this is, it could be possible that uh, our, our kind of like additional scattering that we, that we, that we need is actually kind of buried in, in, inside the, these, these, these uh, um, upper boundaries here as well, because uh, we don't include that. And, and this might actually just be the additional scattering that we require. Um, I can't comment on your previous comments on the kind of experimental evidence, because uh, I guess I'm not too familiar with that. But uh, I mean, if, if you could, if you could um, send me those as well, I, I'd be happy to look at it and, and see you know, um, kind of what, what is the experimental evidence for this out of plane uh, scattering. But uh, yeah, you do make uh, uh, good points that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to look into in the future. Thank you. Sorry, can I, can I, can I ask a quick question? Uh, Casas, thanks very much for the talk. Um, what, on this slide here, when you're talking about L versus W, so L is the interlayer contact distance, to understand that correctly. That would be our, the way we would typically name it in experiments. L is the difference between contacts or is this an in-plane picture? Uh, this is an in-plane picture. Okay, so this is the this is the aspect ratio of yes. my sample. Okay, so do you have a plot? Because you said the resistance or the resistivity should change if I change that aspect ratio. Um, do you do you have any idea of a functional form, or is there? Do, did you calculate what that looks like? So, having um, so so so, I guess. This is the best uh, th that we have right now. Is if you've increased the, the, like the aspect ratio of the sample far enough into the you know the regime where you basically essentially have two parallel boundaries, um, the the magnetic resistance should follow this kind of trend here that we sh uh, I show here with the red uh, dotted curve. Um, yeah, but uh, but modeling uh, in the case of modeling like the four boundaries themselves. Um, uh, yeah, that's a bit beyond, I think, our, our analytics, and I, I can't really find a good way to do that. So in that case, I don't really have a good prediction there. Okay. I mean, it, w one comment about that plot that you reference here is that the difference, the main difference that, that we think this is due is um, you're very sensitive in, in, in this configuration where you apply the field inside the plane. Mm -hmm. You get in the low temperature limit in the so-called coherence peak, which is well uh, established and seen by many AMRO papers. Um, and so the magnetic resistance change that you actually see here is not, is not the thickness dependence. It's just a slight misalignment of field. And here a degree or so out of the, out of the uh, layers um, doesn't change your oscillation amplitude very much, but it significantly changes the background of the magneto resistance that we do not very much take into account. So that's why I'm wondering, I mean, on, on what field scale are we talking? If we talk in the low field, zero field limit of resistivity or in the very low field limit, then yes, this difference is very small. But once we go into the high field limit, that difference relies dramatically on a perfect orientation of the sample because this peak is so sharp as you can see here, this difference is likely just due to a few degrees of misalignment. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, so yeah, thanks for the comment about the misalignment. It's something I actually haven't looked at. So um, it's kind of uh, maybe some new information here that uh, this, this, this would be so, so, so drastic. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I can comment this right away since uh, I'll need to think about it. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the, uh, the comment for the misalignment. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I was thinking about this aspect ratio again. So mm -hmm. you, the, the problem with the vanishing uh, conductance when the electrons all arrive back at the same point. So we solved this with order, but wouldn't this be also actually solved with the, if you treated the motion in 2D like in this, in this box, because the motion then would be maybe chaotic or something. I mean, maybe the disorder that is important is not the disorder of the motion of the electron, but just induced by the scattering of the boundary, because just if the bouncing of the boundary changes, uh, 
changes angle of the electron at some random fashion and will not arrive at the same point. Um, uh, yeah, so, so th thanks for the, uh, the question, uh, the comment, I guess, in this case. Um, yeah, that, that's entirely possible that, uh, you know, we, we treat uh, these boundaries quite maybe idealistically, um, and we maybe don't know what's, what's, what's the, uh, you know, what the true kind of uh, boundary conditions here are, but definitely, yeah, that the, the boundaries probably do play a, a, a large role in kind of establishing this, this, this absolute resistance scale in, 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 in this case. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, thanks everyone. I'm going to stop the recording.